All right, um, welcome. This is the land treatment systems lecture. So what land treatment is, is it's the controlled application of wastewater to, so to soil um, to achieve treatments of constituents in the wastewater. So there's basically a few types of land treatment systems. Um, the first type is slow rate, which we're gonna go through in quite detail. And then we're also gonna go through a little bit more um, intensive types, one called an overland flow system and one called soil aquifer treatment. So again, three treatment systems. All of them are using waste water. So the liquid waste that comes from waste stream, usually after at least primary or secondary treatment. So the treatment mechanisms, mechanisms for these um, land treatment systems. So they might be physical by actually impacting the, the, the waste onto the land absorption, so absorbing the nutrients, and actually filtering the soils and sediments, total solids um, in, in the treatment system. Um, again, it's precipitation and volatilization, so there's chemical treatment, and there's also biological treatment. So again, breaking down the organics, mineralizing the nutrients, decomposing those organics, oxidation, as well as plant uptake, microbial uptake, and um, biological immobilization in the plant biomass. So this is something we've been doing for a really long time. So I'm going to show you a couple of these tables throughout the lecture where it's literally from 1976. <laughs> and this is things that they were doing in terms of trying to have this wastewater and figure out where do we put the wastewater based on the type of, of geology, the type of soils, the type of plant cover, the type of topography, the slope, and then the application rate. So um, the, again, these three systems that we're going to talk about, the slow rate is going to be either a sprinkler or surface application. Um, you're going to pre-treat with either primary treatment in a pond or even secondary treatment with aeration. Um, an overland flow sis, um, system can have a little bit higher amount of nutrients in it, so it might just have screening or primary treatment. And again, a soil aquifer system often has ponds or secondary treatment. The annual loading rate um, is gonna be different with going from low to high, the slow rate system versus overland flow versus the soil um, aquifer treatment systems being higher um, loading rate. And again, the area that we need is gonna be higher for the slow rate treatment. You're gonna have lower land requirements because it's a more intensive system for overland flow and even lower for the soil aquifer treatment. The type of vegetation, again, we're gonna have nutrients um, and could have crop revenue. Here, we're just gonna have grasses. Um, and soil aquifer treatment, we usually don't have any vegetation. Again, in our, um, the, the wastewater is either gonna here, um, it's gonna evaporate or percolate for slow rate. It's gonna be surface runoff, evaporation, and some percolation for overland. And then for soil aquifer, we're always, we're just percolating and basically creating leach fields. So this is the type one, which is the slow rate. So for slow rate, the first type is slow infiltration. So here we are just, this is wastewater. It looks like a sprinkler you might wanna run through, but you don't. <laughs> um, this is just wastewater being, being using sprinklers into forested areas or into croplands. And so for slow infiltration, for here, for, for usually for forest areas, um, the objectives for wastewater treatment, designed to use the most wastewater on the least amount of land, um, so the land area that we need is 100% based on your soil permeability, how much can move through, as well as evaporation. Um, it uses a lower hydraulic loading rate than rapid infiltration or soil aquifer treatment. So we can't put as much on because we're, again, we need it all to infiltrate um, within this, um, the landscape that you're putting it on. Type two is crop irrigation. So this is where we're actually growing it for crops. So here we want to su supply our number one objective is not necessarily the waste treatment. We want that, but it's the crop needs. How much water and how much nutrients do the crop need? And so we match the um, application rate to the crop needs. So it's going to be relative to both the water, how much the water they need, because we don't want to have it um, too saturated so that it becomes anaerobic so, um, ground conditions. And also what does the nutrient need? So we're going to assess both of those things. Um, and then you, um, so water reuse and crop, water, you know, using irrigation, this for irrigation. 
um, and crop production are the primary objectives. And it's gonna be usually distributed over a larger area because we, again, can't super saturate because we want these crops to grow. So we wanna make sure that we're not over applying, um, both from a nutrient standpoint, we don't want nitrogen burning of the crops, for example, as well as from a hydraulic standpoint. So, um, so for municipalities that have wastewater, um, but again, this is often used if you don't have a stream. So where do we, you know, DC water, they put it in the Potomac. But what do you do if you live in some place where there isn't a viable stream or the streams to, um, uh, you can't treat it enough to put it in the stream because the streams are really valuable, clean stream then um, these are the type of things you would use for your wastewater in our small community. And so the municipality that owns this wastewater treatment plant um, in this area might purchase and manage the site themselves. And then the site would be a forest that would be managed by um, the municipality and they would um, um, own that land. It might be a land that you purchase, but you lease it to farmers with the idea that you get to apply you know, to the crop needs, but apply the waste to it. Or you might establish a contract with a farmer for the slow rate application of your wastewater. And again, here's a typical sprinkler irrigation at a floor slow rate fight in Georgia. Um, so first of all, for your design of these systems, you need to know the waste characteristics. Um, the preliminary treatment, is it secondary, primary, um, just pond, is it aerated? Um, if you are doing crops, what crops are gonna be used? What's the distribution system? Are you just doing surface application where it kind of goes over the surface? Are you doing spray sprinklers? Um, what's your hydraulic loading rate? Um, how much area do you have? What storage do you need? Because again, depending on where you're living, you're gonna have to store because we're not gonna have a lot of crops growing in North Dakota in the winter. And so, um, and then that'll based on your total land required need for based on the amount of wastewater that you're, um, that you're um, producing in your municipality. So um, pre-treatment um, for slow rate. So again, we're talking about these sprinkler systems, either for crops or for forested areas. So pre-treatment is necessary for a variety of reasons, um, for public health, so we don't have too much bacteria, and as well as for odor and nuisance control. Um, also to protect your distribution system. So again, if you're using sprinkler systems, you don't want oils and settable solids that would clog. Um, also, you want to, if you do have that plenary treatment, then it'll reduce the amount of land you need to use for the sprinkler system. Um, as well as the reducing of the reduction of odors. Um, also the soil and crop um, considerations. So if your total dissolved solids and your salinity are too high, then it may not be good for the crops that you're trying to grow. And so you need to make sure that you don't have solids that are gonna build up on top and reduce the permeability as well as too much salinity for the crops. So again, for pre-treatment, so primary treatment, um, if you're only going to do primary, that's only acceptable if you're doing an isolated location. So you're spraying in a woods where people won't be around it. It's restricted access. If you're doing biological treatment by a lagoon or some sort of in-plant process, um, then you need, you want your fecal count to be less than a thousand um, MPMs per 100 milliliters. So this would be acceptable for agricultural um, irrigation, except for human food crops that would be um, eaten raw. And then finally, if you're doing biological treatment by lagoons um, and you have additional controls plus disinfection to get under 200 um, MPM per 100 mils, which is the fecal coliform limit for bathing waters, then you can put it in parks, golf courses, and other places for your slow rate systems. Again, and most probable number of BOD, we know these. Um, so again, some design considerations. So crop selection, um, you're gonna consider the economics, the growing conditions, the growing season, the soil, the slope, um, the wastewater characteristics. So um, for type one, um, we're often going to use um, forage, legumes, tree crops. Um, we might wanna get money for firewood, pulp, biomass fuel, if we're going in a forest. Um, but again, it must be compatible with the high hydraulic loading rate. Um, we want something with a high nutrient uptake capacity for nitrogen phosphorus. So we're not only get removal as we move through the soil surface, but we're also getting uptake. Um, again, you want crops that, that like water and that will, that will bring up water through their roots. Um, crops that like moist soils, um, tolerant to wastewater um, constituents. So, you know, relatively high total dissolved solids content. There might be some chlorine if you're doing treatment, um, salinity, and then again, um, so be compatible with this loading rate. Um, so you wanna make sure something that you can put on the soil and, 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 and can deal with the amount of water going onto the soil. 
So type two would be high value crops or landscape vegetation. So you might do some shrubs or some flowering plants that again would have um, those the tolerance. So it can be legumes, tree crops, or high value crops. So when we look at um, our hydraulic loading rate, so there's various calculations we're gonna do to figure out how much loading rate we can have. So for type one, we're gonna just be thinking about um, the evapotranspiration minus precipitate, um, sorry, evapotranspiration minus precipitation rate plus the percolation rate that's going through our soil. And so if we look at the percolation rate, our daily percolation rate is gonna be our K value, which is the permeability of the limiting soil layers in inches per hour or milliliters per hour times this value, this 0.04 to 0.1, which is gonna be an adjustment factor, okay? And then times your 24 hours a day. So at your daily rate, you might have a yearly rate or a monthly rate. Um, for type two, um, we're gonna again do the evaporation minus precipitation plus one plus this leaching requirement. So this might be what we, the leaching requirement, it's a fraction um, over the irrigation efficiency so um, we'll go over that a little bit here. So the hydraulic loading rate, again, is gonna be your water balance on a monthly basis with usually precipitation evaporation values you'll use basically over the wettest year in the past 10 years. You don't wanna use last year as if last year was a super dry year. So you wanna find like kind of your worst case scenario and design around that. Um, for all but forested type one systems, um, if you have surface runoff, you wanna be capturing that and reapplying it. So if it's like a golf course or other things, we might capture in a pond and then we might reapply that um, for those systems. Um, percolation in type one is usually measured in field. Um, and there's a range of soil permeabilities that you can get from the NRCS soil so that you can know for your soil type what the permeability might be, but you're also gonna test it. Um, and again, the adjustment factor um, reflects the percentage of time that the soil is wet, the soil permeability, and a soil type variation. So again, like a 7% adjustment factor, maybe that, because the, it, how much it varies, the soil type may vary from one area to another. Type two, again, the hydraulic loading rate is gonna be more dependent on these crop irrigation requirements. Um, this leaching requirement depends on the crops, um, the total dissolved solids are the ratio and the amount of precipitation. So if we have a low total dissolved solids in the wastewater and high um, crop tolerance, then the leaching requirement, the fraction might be 0 0.1 to 0 0.15. If we have a high total dissolved solids, then that might go up to 0 0.2 to 0 0.3. Um, and then the sprinkler efficiency is the percent of water that evaporates before it even reaches the root zones. So a sprinkler, this can be at high as like 70, 80% gets evaporated and then gets on the surface and also evaporates. Um, with surface application, because you're not having that sprinkler and you're not distributing, it may only be 60 to 75%. But again, it depends on climatic conditions. Um, so if we look at nitrogen loading rates, so these are some examples of forage crops. So again, we have canary grass, we have um, clovers, so we have field crops that we might use as well. Again, we might use um, trees, so hardwoods and pines, um, firs. And these are their nitrogen uptake rates in pounds per acre year. And so again, these are, all these are going to vary. And so you're going to pick based on where you are, what your needs are, what the economics is, and understanding you want to find something with a higher nitrogen uptake rate if you're going to be using slow rate application. So often the, the nitrogen loading rate might be the limiting design factor more than the hydraulic loading rate. Um, so the total nitrogen limitations is often based on a max nitrate concentration of 10 milligrams per liter before the percolate comes in contact with groundwater. So we wanna say we want it to be treated to at least 10 um, through um, nitrification, denitrification, um, so that no more than 10 is still there. Um, again, since these are usually um, aerobic systems, not anaerobic systems, we're not gonna get as much denitrification happening. So that's why we concentrate on that nitrate level because we know that we're gonna get nitrate buildup due to lack of anaerobic conditions. Um, how the nitrogen are removed through uptake, um, again, biological reduction, nitrification, denitrification, as well as you're gonna get ammonia volatilization as well. So our equations for nitrogen loading rates, um, again, our nitrogen loading rates in pounds per acre per year is going to be your crop uptake. Um, the fraction of the applied nitrogen lost to nitrification, denitrification, um, volatilization, and soil storage. So all of those things together is one fraction. Um, so it might be 20%, 30%, a conversion factor, um, as well as the concentration that you're saying of, of nitrogen, the percolates, so we might set that at 10. Um, and then again, the flow rate. So what is the percolation rate? 
And um, again, this, this fraction of N is, is lost is going to um, depend on the wastewater characteristics as well as the temperature, so it is going to vary. And so we put this all together for our hydraulic loading rate with the precipitation evaporation and the crop needs, then you can have this equation here where we're looking at here's the concentration in the, per in the percolate. Um, so the max concentration we want, here's our concentration in the wastewater, um, precipitation evaporation plus our, for our conversion factor, our uptake rate, and then our fraction here. So um, if we look at denitrification loss factors for slow rates, um, it depends too on the carbon nitrogen ratio. So again, if it has a lower ratio, then we're gonna have a lower um, denitrification loss rate. If we're in a warm climate, we're gonna have a higher one than if we're in a cold climate. If it's a fairly clean water, we're gonna have less denitrification taking place because we don't have a lot of carbon. We know the denitrification is a heter um, heterogeneous microorganisms that do that, so they need a carbon source. So again, a, a cleaner wastewater with a lower carbon to nitrogen ratio is gonna have a lower factor as well as cold's gonna have a lower factor. Um, so again, we need to figure out how much land we need to apply this wastewater. And so our land requirement is going to be our area times the flow rate divided by um, our conversion constant, which is 0 0.027, times the loading rate in inches per year. Um, and so then we have our storage requirements. So wastewater is stored when it's going to be too wet or too cold for land application. So these, so too wet, that can happen any time of the year. You need storage for that. Um, for too cold, <laughs> it's going to depend on um, where you live if we're looking at the U.S. So here, this line is 12 months per year. So if we're below this line, we can apply for 12 months per year. We do need some storage for too wet, but we should be able to apply um, for 12 months a year. Um, Maryland is almost all, but not in Garrett County, <laughs> for 10 months a year. Um, then we go up here for Pennsylvania, eight months a year. <laughs> up here in, um, in the very cold, we're going to be in six months, and then there's, you know, some variations in here. Um, so again, um, forested sites may be irrigated more than other sites, but again, you're not going to get as much treatment, so you need storage. And if their crops aren't growing, you can't apply them on crops. Um, so again, your distribution, um, there's different distribution systems. Um, you might have, so for example, these sprinkler systems, they have wheel lines, solid set, a center pivot, a traveling gun that shoots it out. Um, for your service system, you might have graded borders, you might have straight furrows, you might have a drip irrigation system. Um, so again, these, it depends on the soil, the crop, the topography, the economics. Um, sprinkler systems may just do like once every couple days, they may turn off and then go on and off. Um, but the schedule is going to depend on, again, the climate, the soil permeability, and the moisture, soil moisture. Um, and often you might have fields separated into subsections, so you might irrigate this system and then go over here and then go over here um, so that you have like a cycle it goes through. Um, so again, now we're going to look at the, um, these are the um, surface, if we have, so we've got done with flow rate. And now we're going to look at um, if you have some under, under drainage, for example. So with some of these, it may be that when we're applying, so in Ohio, for example, in cropland anyway, they often have tile drainage underneath because they're kind of in wetlandy areas. And so the groundwater table can come up. And so you get waterlogged soils. And so we might actually in this, when we do these applications, we might actually have um, some sort of collection well or under drain where we collect it. And so again, it might be a sump pump, it might be a pond, and then we would reapply what we caught, um, what, we, what we captured. Um, and again, these may be necessary to prevent lot water logging of the surface um, or to not hit the groundwater. And so these under drains are going to be like four to six inch perforated pipes that you basically have perforations for them to come in, dairy, buried about six to eight feet in the soil. Um, again, about 300 feet apart in the soil drainage and sandy soils, and they're gonna be closer together in clay soils. So again, and we're looking at these slow rate systems. Um, advantages, so it's not very much operational labor or chemical or energy requirements compared to conventional treatment systems. Um, and so you do have an economic return because you're using, especially if you're using it for crop, doing type two, um, you can, you're using the water and you're using the nutrients. So that's an economic um, advantage. Um, little to no disposal costs of the effluent. And again, you're, you're recycling water, so you're reducing tr um, treatment costs for crop productions. Um, disadvantages, it's a large land area. 
um, for application. Um, if it's in the winter, you have to store. Again, you need to select the right site and you need to think about the dissolved salt content. Um, if it's too much, again, if it's really wet soils, because you're gonna keep these wet and apply to them and you have a very high slope, you may get erosion. And again, you need to make sure that you characterize the soil and the groundwater well so that you know um, what an appropriate infiltration rate is. Um, again, the application rates get go down during the winter time and during cold months. And again, the potential odor and vector problems if adequate pretreatment is not employed. So the effluent water quality that we would like to see, um, we would like to see 90 to 100% removal of BOD, total solids, 50 to 80% removal of total nitrogen, um, 80 to 100%, 99% removal of total um, uh, phosphorus, and we wanna see all the removal of fecal coliforms. So that's our goal. So moving on, so that was the slow read, and now we're gonna move on to a different type of system. Again, we're still dealing with liquid wastewater, but now we're talking about overland flow systems. So for overland flow systems, we are going to have um, often a sprinkler app application here. So we're going to get evapotranspiration as well. And then we're just going to move through kind of like a grassy swale, to be honest. Um, so it's going to move through these grassy swells. But in this grassy swell, again, we're going to keep the grass a little bit longer so that we're going to have this, this biofilm that forms over this grassy swell. So it's this biogeological slime layer. And then we'll have an effluent collection point where we'll collect it. And again, depending on where we are, we may then discharge it into a stream. Um, we may recirculate it, um, depending on the type of system and what permit you have. Um, so <clears throat> the vegetation and grass serves as this matrix for microbial growth, basically. You're creating a, um, a trickling filter, basically. Um, so we may need a permit if, um, so showing that we're meeting the, 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 BOD and TSS requirements, and it can be used for pretreatment, secondary treatment for extra nitrogen removal. We might have this, and then we might start to do slow rate right after this, um, but it's not as good as pathogen removal um, as it is with nitrogen, the phosphorus, and, and organic removal. Um, so again, storage days, same thing. Um, down the south, we don't need as many storage days as you move more, more. Storage days anywhere from 40, 60, 120 days, 160 days storage. And so again, similar, we have calculating the treatment area, assuming a certain hydraulic loading rate. <clears throat> so for, um, again, for these over, um, overland flow, um, again, the um, slow you permeable soils, we want the soils to be those that are gonna help with the percolation um, with a moderately permeable topsoil. But again, we're not actually interested in most of it being treated in the soil, we're interested in most of it going over the soil. So it's overland flow versus percolation. Okay, so we're not as interested in the percolation. We're going to get some, but we don't want a lot. We want the grass to grow and we want the, the tr really to be a trickling filter. Um, but again, it's just the sheet flow downgrade. We want anywhere from zero to 12% grade, a minimum of 2%. Um, if it's less than two, we might get ponding. Um, but if it's more than 8%, then we might get short circling and erosion due to the grade. Um, so again, if we look at um, the treatment removal, denitrification can have about 60 to 80 percent of the of the nitrogen removal because again, these are the very thick biofilm that's formed. Um, for ammonia removal, if you have a lot of ammonia coming in, then you need this wet dry ratio. So what that means is we need some dry time so that we can nitrify and then some wet time so that it'll denitrify. Um, phosphorus removal, again, is about only 40 to 50 percent because there's not a lot of soil to wastewater content. Again, this is more of an overflow system, so we're limiting our phosphorus absorption that can take place, which can take place in the soil matrix. But again, we're not using the soil matrix for these systems. And again, the heavy removal depends on absorption similar to phosphorus, so it really just depends, but we aren't going to get as much as we would when we're using a soil matrix. Um, just some nitrogen removal. These are some examples. So here was primary effluent. Nothing happened with it. This was pond effluent. So we just had a, a primary pond. Here was secondary raw um, screened, so sorry, screened raw wastewater. Had nothing. <clears throat> so here are some different application rates with, again, different, with the raw wastewater, we had a much higher BOD to N ratio. Um, and so this is, again, how much was applied, um, the crop uptake that we got. Um, and um, the denitrification removal. So again, anywhere from 92 removal based on your 
crop uptake, most of it being though in the nitrification, denitrification, a much smaller percentage, 800 versus 100 in crop uptake. Um, so most of it is removed, 92% of it was removed with most of that being 80% of that almost being through nitrification and denitrification, 90%, sorry. Um, and so um, if we look at, um, oops, sorry about that. If we look at the hydraulic loading rate, um, it's going to be very similar to the slow rate systems and how we calculate it. Um, but again, we can either have a sprinkler system or an overflood. So again, this is a two to 8% flow into our drainage ditches. Um, so it can be by sprinklers or by a gated pipe. Um, and so again, your flow is going to be the application rate. Um, and then your application period, typically that can be six to 12, um, six to 12 hours a day, typically about eight hours a day, it would be applied. Um, we have a conversion factor, a slope length, which is our Z. And again, your application rates, depending on the limiting factor, which is typically BOD, um, the organics that we want to remove. Um, the longer the slope, the greater the removal. Um, and um, often we'll have anywhere from 120 to 150 feet coming down. Again, for our design, we're going to select the limiting design parameter, the application rate, the period, select the slope length, and then calculate the hydraulic um, um, loading rate, so be hydraulic loading rate, um, the field area, and the storage volume. And so this is, a, a, again, a schematic of here's the gated pipe coming here, here's our collection pipe, and here's the plan view. So again, for a system without storage, um, this is going to be your area that you need. A system with storage, you're going to take into account um, the number of operating days in the year. So finally, we're moving on to our soil aquifer treatment systems. So again, this is where we have wastewater treatment where we don't want any direct discharge at all. Everything is going to percolate through the soil. So again, our important things are the soil depth, the soil permeability, the depth to groundwater, and the groundwater flow direction. So you can think of this as just basically building instead of individual leach fields. It's where you have a community coming together and we're building like kind of a big leach field, okay? So just like in the leach field, you don't have a septic tank system. It just goes to the septic tank. There's some treatment that happens there and then it goes into your leach field. This is gonna be similar and that you're going to, it's very high strength wastewater. It's gonna come together and then it's gonna remove all the way through soil permeability. So the soil characteristics are really important. Um, again, good for BOD, TSS, and pathogen removal. And again, the removal of metals and phosphorus depends on the travel distance, how much soil we have till we hit groundwater, and the soil properties. Um, so again, you might have some sort of pre-application. You might have aeration, aeration screening. Um, you would have an emergency storage system. And then basically it just goes into these splash ponds. So it basically comes in, splashes onto the surface, and then it just infiltrates. That's all we're doing is infiltrating down through the soil system. There is no outflow pipe. Versus the overland flow, there is a discharge point. Um, so again, we need to characterize the soil and groundwater conditions, the hydraulic pathway to percolate, the infiltration rate, um, the treatment requirements, the appropriate application of pre the appropriate level of pre-application treatment, um, the base and the groundwater modeling, and then finally figuring out what your monitoring is going to be. So if we look at nutrient removal in these soil aquatic systems, um, so aquifer systems, excuse me, um, then we have found anamox removal actually happening in the systems. Again, nitrification rates of up to 60 pounds per acre day under favorable moisture and, and temperature conditions, which is really high. Um, but again, temperatures less than 36 degrees will result in ammonia being um, retained. And so we won't get as much treatment as it gets colder. Um, nitro removal, again, is a function of the detention time, the BOD to end ratio, and if there's anoxic conditions. Um, for effective removal, um, for about 80% removal of the nitrogen, the loading rate of less than six inches per day and a BOD to nitrogen ratio greater than three to one is what we're looking for. And again, phosphorus removal occurs via absorption and chemical precipitation with the um, former occurring quickly and the chemical um, precipitation replenishing the soil absorption capacity. So again, looking at our nitrogen loading rate, we're gonna be looking at our hydraulic loading rate times our conversion factor 0.23 times the nitrogen wastewater concentration coming in times the number of days operating. 
Um, we have seen looking at endocrine disruptors. So again, looking at percolation through 120 feet of unconsolidated soil, reduce this estrogenic activity by about 95%. So again, looking at um, this could be, a, again, with the more soil we get some more complex matrix, you actually could get better wastewater treatment doing this than a traditional wastewater treatment plant. Again, our land area um, being our conversion factor, our flow, our hydraulic loading rate. And then here's the area that you would need um, based on the concentration of nitrogen. Um, again, for organic loading rate often receives 100 pounds per acre per day, it can be up to 300. Um, the BOD can be anywhere from 5 to 20, up to 100. Um, we usually get 90 to 95% removal of BOD. And again, um, we do need to make sure that if the BOD is really high that we're um, taking into account any odor concerns that would happen with that strong BOD. Um, TSS, again, usually it's pretty effective unless you get some algae on the surface, which we don't want. Um, but our effluent is going to be pretty low. And again, um, but if we do um, too much, then we could get um, clogging of the soil, which would remove our effective um, infiltration rate. So again, this is again um, the characteristics that we did. We again talked about slow rate, we talked about overland flow, which again is the surface runoff, evaporation, some percolation, and then the soil aquifer treatment, which is all percolation and some evaporation. Um, so again, if we're looking at, at planning, um, so these are planning estimates for different systems. And so again, if you're looking at pond systems versus constructed wetlands versus subsurface wetlands versus low weight aquifer or soil aquifer treatments. So these are the acres that you might need for these different systems um, in the north, the mid-Atlantic and the south. So since we're in the mid-Atlantic, we'll focus on that. So again, if we look at a facultative pond, we're looking at 102 acres needed for treating a certain amount of wastewater, um, one, one million gallons per day um, versus a Free water surface um, constructed wetland, we would need about 47, a subsurface about 20. Slow rate, we need a lot more. <laughs> and then soil aquifer would be less. So this is just kind of um, how you can see how these a pond system versus wetland versus some of these um, treatment systems for your wastewater. Um, again, back to the 1970s, <laughs> this is something we have been doing for a long time. And again, these are these what now used to be called rapid infiltration, which is our soil aquifer treatment or for land flow and slow rate. So we've been using these um, for a long time. And this is again, comparison of different um, systems and how much, um, if they recharge the groundwater, crops for sale um, and the recovery of water. Finally, there's biosolids. So again, this is only the water component. So usually there's solid separation and those biosolids might be treated or composted for first or they may just be separated. And so for biosolids applications, again, for agriculture, we're often doing that throughout the year. And the typical loading rate being, um, these are a million gallons per, per hectare, metric tons per hectare. Um, and so um, in forest, usually it's an interval. So we're gonna do it and then go to a different site, different site, we can do a much higher loading rate. Um, for reclamation land, we're just gonna put the biosolids on that on one time just to build up the soil profile with organic matter. Um, and again, for if we're doing type B biosolids, B application for crop growth, we can do a higher growing rate. So, um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna go through, um, this will be the last thing we'll do for this lecture, is we're gonna go through an example where we have to calculate the land area needed for a type one slow rate system for a thousand people in a moderately warm climate. So the design flow for this system is 6,500 gallons per day. So a partially mixed area of the lagoon before um, we need to treat it the in the slow rate system, produces an effluent with 50 milligrams BOD and 30 milligrams total nitrogen. So this is what's going into our slow rate system. Um, a site's been located with a relatively uniform soil and a limiting soil permeability at K value of 0.2 inches per hour with a 7% adjustment factor. The selected mixtures of, grass, of forage grasses will take up about 300 pounds um, per acre year of nitrogen with a 25% denitrification ratio and a nitrate so, um, percolation limit of 10 milligrams per liter. The water balance of evaporation and precipitation shows a net evaporation rate of 18 inches per year. So we're gonna get more evaporation than um, precipitation on a yearly basis. And the conversion 
Oh, note, when we do the calculations, you're gonna see in here this 8.34 value. And that 8.34 is actually the conversion factor using million gallons per day and milliliters per liter to get to pounds per day. So it's based on the conversion from grams to pounds and the conversion from liters to gallons, and then with some unit conversions all mashed in there together, and the value you get the conversion factor is 8.34. So that's just telling you how we got that value as we move through the example. So um, again, the first thing you're gonna do is we're gonna design it first based on hydraulic loading rate. So the percolation rate um, using this equation is, and we're gonna use a 7% factor. So again, our K value times the 0.07 times 24 hours a day, 360, um, days per year is, uh, again, our K value is, so that altogether, the 0.07 times 25 times 365 is, three, is 613 times our 0.2 K value equals 123 inches per year. So then we're going to do our wastewater loading um, using evaporation, transpiration, and percolation. So our net evaporation minus transportation is, precipitation, excuse me, is 18, plus we get 123 inches um, with percolation. So our loading rate is 141 inches per year. So then we're going to calculate the field area that we need based on soil permeability. Um, so we have 65,000 gallons per day times 365 days per year. Again, the conversion factor of, of um, millions of gallons to um, gallons. And so then that tells us so we get our million gallons per year times again that conversion factor, which is 0.027 times our permeability, which is 141. And so for, based on our loading rate, we need 6.2 acres. So that's how many acres we need to, for the water to deal with the hydraulic loading rate. Now we're gonna calculate it based on nitrogen and knowing that we need that nitrogen limit of 10 milligrams per liter and with our denitrification percentage of 25. So when we do that, we have again, our, our um, loading rate based on nitrogen with 10 is our limit that we have. This negative 18 is our precipitation minus evapotranspiration plus 4.4, which is our conversion factor, plus 4.4 times U, which is that 300, with the, which is the 300 pounds per acre per year, divided by our 30, that's the nitrogen that we had coming into, the F, um, coming into our slow rate systems, minus one minus 0.25, which are denitrification factor, minus again our 10, which was our um, 10 milligrams per liter, which was our limit um, in nitrate. So, 91.2 inches per year, and then we're going to calculate the field area the same way we did the other field area, which is um, the gallons of wastewater times 0.027 times our infiltration rate based on nitrogen, um, and our uptake rate based on nitrogen, which is 9.6 acres per year. Okay, so now we're going to look at the organic loading, assuming that 9.6 acres nitrogen limit will be the required field area. And so with, if we look at just our BOD, that's when I was talking about this 8.4. So if we take our wastewater times our BOD times our conversion factor, um, so we get our loading and then we do it per acre. So we're gonna get our 2.8 um, pounds per acre. So therefore our BOD is not loading because it's much less than the 450 um, pounds per acre, okay? So we know that we need to base it based on nitrogen because the nitrogen limit, the 9.6, was larger than the area required for serial permeability, which is 6.2 acres. So for this 100,000 um, person um, wastewater treatment plant with this mixed aerated lagoon, we're gonna have to find um, nine acres of land to do a slow rate sprinkler system, type one sprinkler system, okay? So hopefully I will post this lecture so you guys will have time to go through this um, yourself and make sure you can follow the calculations. But um, that's the end of the lecture for the um, land treatment systems of liquid waste and solid waste.